80% of the U.S. population is pre-diabetic. So you need to get your labs tested, even if you don't have any symptoms. So what labs do you need to get done? And what do they mean? In this video, I break this down so you can actually feel empowered. I'm Dr. Jake. I'm a naturopathic medical doctor and integrated physician. On this channel, I'll share with you how you can heal your body down to the root causes without any harmful drugs or surgery. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. Okay, let's jump in. Why would we care about our blood sugar anyways, if it's high or elevated, or why should we care if it's starting to trend upward? So it's a big thing. So blood sugar is not like, oh, it's just going to cause damage really down the road. It's going to give me maybe peripheral neuropathy. It's going to maybe cause some eyesight issues. These are all big, bad things that can happen. You could go blind from diabetes. You could lose your extremities from diabetes. But I don't think most people think about it as a systemic inflammatory response that happens when your blood sugar starts getting elevated. So let's say, let's talk about one test that's important to do is called like a hemoglobin A1C. And let's say your blood sugar is at 5.6, not necessarily in the pre-diabetic range of 5.7 to 6.5, but definitely too elevated and definitely causing a lot of inflammation in your body and could be making some of the conditions that you have worse. It could be a piece of your fatigue. It could maybe be a piece of your headaches. Maybe it's a piece of like your arthritis pain. This all could be possibly related to a higher blood sugar. And if you get that blood sugar down, these symptoms can go away. So blood sugar is like the root of all health. If you look at like all the medical conditions out there, especially the chronic ones, blood sugar has a piece in there. So it's a really important thing to know and get under control. So in a previous episode, I talked about uh, blood sugar and the issues with it. So it really is a huge epidemic. So there's some startling numbers out there that 80% of Americans are pre-diabetic. That's pretty crazy, right? Pre-diabetic is hemoglobin A1C 5.27 to 6.5. And I just talked about how big blood sugar issues, how big of an issue it is. So we have a very inflamed society, a very sick society, just with blood sugars being that high. It's an epidemic, especially in the United States. It's really an issue worldwide. We need to get our blood sugar checked and we need to get it under control. Just because you feel good doesn't mean that your blood sugar is good. It could be this lingering problem that's hanging out and could just blow up later in your life if you don't get it under control. Let's talk about what labs we really need to get done. I'm going to go really in detail of what the labs I do for patients that come into me that have diabetes or really just are have some metabolic syndrome, or they're concerned about their blood sugar. So first one I want to start with is just a basic easy one, is a fasting blood sugar. So you go in the doctor fasting, we do a basic blood drop, we take a look at that. We want your fasting blood sugar to be 75 to 89. That's a good healthy fasting blood sugar. I don't see any concerns with that. I like it and everything looks good. You start getting into the 90s, this is being picky. It's still decent, but that is trending upwards. And it can be inflammatory for your body. So if we start seeing that you're in the 90s or above, I start getting concerned and I'm going to be talking about possibly eating a lower carb diet or so, do some type of treatment to decrease their overall blood sugar throughout their body. The second one I want to talk about is a very important one, probably the most important out of them all. And it checks our blood sugar over a four month period of time. So a fasting blood sugar can change if you've been really eating a bad diet just recently. but a hemoglobin A1C, you have to eat a whole bad diet for four months. And most people, they're like, oh yeah, I had a really bad two weeks. Well, that's not going to really change things a ton and maybe slightly, but not a lot. So the hemoglobin A1C number, where we want this to be is you could be like at 4.8 to 5.4. That is a healthy hemoglobin A1C. If you could get closer to five, it's even healthier, but you could feel really good about yourself if you're keeping yourself 5.4 or lower. That's not a bad blood sugar there. That's not going to cause a lot of inflammation. It's going to be good. So it's good to go there. Now let's dive into insulin. So we want to do a fasting insulin. Insulin is what is produced when you eat sugar. It's released from your pancreas. And we want to see how much is being produced. So if you're starting to get insulin sensitivity, desensitization of your cells to insulin, that is a big problem. And what we're going to see is we're going to see the insulin start to tick up. Because your body is going to be like, oh, wait, we're not able to get all the sugar in, in our bloodstream that we want inside our cells. So we need to actually start making more insulin so we could get this in there. And then that could be a big problem because over time, your pancreas will start shutting down 
and then you actually have to take insulin and things like that. So it's a good thing to monitor if you have diabetes or even if you don't know that you have diabetes. We would like to take a look at that and see how much insulin you're pumping out because it definitely can shut down your pancreas over time. And then we can't really do a lot without taking insulin at that point. So yeah, insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance is related to pumping out way too much insulin. You're not going to notice a lot in the very beginning, right? So you have a lot of sugar in your bloodstream, you produce a lot of insulin, you're not going to really notice anything. But then over time, when you keep on producing a ton of insulin, your cells say, hey, I can't keep up with this. We're actually bringing too much sugar in there. And they start decreasing receptor sites on the outside of the cells. So then you're not able to get as much insulin in there. And then there's a big problem of insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. Then over time, like I said, your pancreas starts shutting down. So yeah, it's a slippery slope and it's very slow. And you have no idea what's happening internally. Except if you're really in tune with your body, you can notice when your blood sugar is high, but most people don't really know what's going on there. So let's talk about fasting. Yeah, so fasting is really needed because your blood sugar is going to be completely different if you eat before doing the test. So fasting is 12 hours before you do a test is how long you need to not eat anything. You should drink water, but you don't want any juice or any food in your body for at least 12 hours. Right after you do the test, you can eat and drink a sugary drink. So what is another test that I like? So this one is similar to insulin, but it gives us a little different look. It's a C-peptide and it's a different way of measuring insulin. And I like it because insulin can be a really hard test to get a really accurate test. So I like to do both to get a real good look at what your insulin is doing and what it looks like. And if there's any modifications we need to do with your diet regarding that. And a C-peptide level, having it from like 1.1 to 4.4, Maybe having it in the middle there is ideal. That's what I like to do is I always do to do a C-peptide with the fasting insulin because it gives me a more detailed look at the insulin and I'm able to see the fasting insulin and the C-peptide and really come up with a game plan of what we need to do for a patient's blood sugar control and really get a look at if they are starting to get insulin resistance. So another big one I like to look at, and these aren't really related to sugar at all at this point. Now we're going to look at triglyceride levels. Very important one. Triglycerides usually are elevated when your body isn't metabolizing sugar very well. Your body isn't bringing in sugar in its cells very well. And it makes sense. So your body isn't getting sugar in its cell very well. So it needs fuel from a different source now. So it starts breaking down your fat and starts releasing fatty acids, triglycerides into your bloodstream for energy production. So that could get out of control. And it can really cause your blood to get really thick and it could lead to plaques forming in your arteries because of the inflammation from the blood sugar. And then you have the high triglycerides and then that can implant itself on an artery leading to an embolus and that leads to a heart attack or stroke. So a big problem also just makes it really thick. So it increases your risks of having a heart attack or stroke at that point too. Are there any symptoms of high triglycerides? The unfortunate thing is there's not any symptoms of high triglycerides except if you actually go into ketoacidosis. And this is you're going to get headaches, you're going to get jittery, you're going to get shaky, you're going to get lightheaded and dizzy, and you could pass out. That's when you're actually in ketoacidosis, and it's a really bad issue. And you need to go to hospital immediately when that happens because it's a big no. But you're not going to know that till it actually happens. So that's why you need to actually get your blood work done because you're not going to notice it symptomatically. This is another uh, lipid profile. It's an HDL test. And this is looking at our healthy cholesterol. So we have the LDL, we have the HDL, we have VLDL. H LDL, VLDL, these are considered the bad cholesterols. And HDL is our good guy. And the reason why it's considered the good guy is it helps take cholesterol out of our body. And the higher we have that, the better it is. So if we have like a HDL, I like to have it at 50 to like maybe 75 or 80. Interesting thing is I see some people, they think they're really healthy and I see their HDL is at 90 and there's research actually showing that you have, if you have that high of an HDL, you might be looking at an autoimmune disease down the road. So having your HDL too high could definitely possibly be an issue, but we want to keep it about 50 to 80. That's really healthy. We increase that number from exercise is the main one that we actually increase our HDL numbers. Yeah. So what do lipids have to do with blood sugar? not necessarily going to tell us exactly what the blood sugar is doing, but it's telling us about your metabolism. So when you have high blood sugar, there are things that change with your body. 
and how you're utilizing energy stores. And when your blood sugar goes high, it tends to really affect your HDL and that starts to go down. And like we talked about, triglycerides start to go up because of your lack of sugar getting inside your cells and now your body's using more fat for its energy source. So we like to take a look at that just to see how your metabolism is doing, but I also look at it because there's all kinds of other health issues that go along with high blood sugar. Your risk of heart attack and stroke is going to be greatly elevated in the future. So we need to take care of those. So yeah, we don't want to just look at your blood sugar. We need to look at all your health factors that are related to what changes with your blood sugar. So that's why we take a look at these lipid profiles. And talking about that, like why do we care about actually checking your vitamin D, right? That's one test I like to look at. So vitamin D is needed for healthy bones and all that. We know about that. But it is very important for our immune system. I call it our hormone of the immune system. Vitamin D really acts like a hormone. It sends messages and it helps balance out inflammatory states. So if we have too little, inflammation is going to be high. If we have too much, it's going to cause all kinds of other issues. I like to keep it at 50 to 80 is where I like to keep the vitamin D level at. And some of the big detriments to high blood sugar is the inflammation. And one way we can help the inflammation get under control is keeping your vitamin D in a good range. So that's why it's important to really check your vitamin D because we need to be looking at what your inflammatory state looking like when we check your blood sugar. Could insulin desensitization be related to low vitamin D levels? Not exactly. Just like everything else looks good and your vitamin D is low, is it going to lead to that? No, but it will cause a more increased inflammatory state. And a big cause of insulin resistance is inflammation, just like it is related to so many other medical conditions. But that's what's causing that cellular damage and not making it work very well. So keeping your vitamin D in the appropriate range will help keep your inflammation in a better control and help prevent the insulin resistance. But to say vitamin D is the cause is not necessarily. Let's talk about another one I really love to order. It's called the HS C-reactive protein, also known as highly sensitive C-reactive protein. This is an inflammatory marker, and specifically, it tells me about the inflammation around the blood vessel. And this is, just brings up like the lipids. Let's say you have slightly high triglycerides. Let's say your cholesterol is a little bit above 200, which isn't a huge concern if your HDL is good and your LDL is in a good range. So that's not that important there. But let's say you have a little bit elevated LDL and decreased HDL. So that can happen. And if your inflammation is all good and your blood sugar is all good, we're all good to go. But if not, it's going to be a huge problem. And I almost always see an elevated HSC reactive protein when someone has elevated blood sugar, especially if someone's at like hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 or higher, I start seeing that number tick up. When I see that number up, I get really concerned because that really elevates your risks of forming a clot, forming an embolus, leading to a heart attack or stroke or big issues down the road. It doesn't matter how much fat you eat. It does matter if you're eating good quality fat or not. But blood sugar is much more important than the fat because what's going to happen is the fat is the mass, but the inflammation is the stickiness. So let's say you have a, your inflammation under control. It's going to be this clean, slick slate just for this fat to just transfer through. No problem. It's just going to go and get inside your cells and make your brain happy, make your endocrine organs happy and all that. But if you have this inflammatory process going on, it's going to stick there. And that's when it's going to form the clot and lead to stroke and heart attacks. So let's dive into something that I don't order for all my patients that have blood sugar dysregulation. But if someone's coming in and I see that they probably have some blood sugar issues, I need to rule out maybe type 1 diabetes and autoimmune condition. So I'm going to order some like islet cell antibodies or insulin antibodies for me to really get a good look at if they do have type 1 diabetes because we want to rule that out. We don't want to be working with all this dietary stuff or inflammatory stuff if they're not producing enough insulin in the first place because we have to give them insulin because their pancreas is too damaged now and they're not able to make any insulin. So we have to give them insulin so they're actually able to get the sugar in. But that doesn't mean that we don't help type 1 diabetics. There's a lot we could do dietarily and inflammatory wise to really improve their abilities to manage their blood sugar so they don't have to take as much insulin and not have as many blood sugar dysregulations. There's a lot of issues that go along with that. But we do want to order these type of tests if I have someone comes in and they're the first time I've seen them and they don't have a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes or type 1 yet, I'm going to be ordering these insulin antibody tests. So last thing I want to attack 
is I would like to take a look at someone's cortisol levels. So how does that have anything to do with blood sugar? Cortisol actually has a lot to do with it. So what I'd like to do is a diurnal cortisol test. What this does is check your cortisol morning, afternoon, evening, and night. It will release sugar from your liver and cause your blood sugar to be constantly elevated. So let's say you're a really stressed person. You might be working out, you might be running, you might be eating well, but you could still have blood sugar issues because of your stress. If you're interested in getting some of these tests done or get treated in a more holistic approach, visit my website, www.integrativemedica.com. Find my phone number there. You could give my receptionist a call. You could set up an appointment with me or some of my other great doctors that we have here. You could also set up an appointment directly online on our website. If you want to learn more about blood sugar spikes and how to lower it, click my videos to the right. I'm Dr. Jake, and I'll see you there.